Hey, many blessings, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. This is King Kevin Dorval. You are now officially uh, live in the building. Of course, I am your host, Mr. Kevin Dorval himself. Checking in. I hope you all had a blessed day. As you can see, I'm dressed a bit sharp for this occasion. But I, however, and if too sharp to represent, you know, your ancestors. Today's show is about the Haitian Revolution and the father of the revolution, the Haitian Revolution, Mr. Toussaint Louverture, um, the one and only, the general that led Haiti to victory, and uh, a couple other the generals. But we're going to talk about that. So, what I'm definitely going to do here is uh, give a quick prayer. And we're going to begin with the show. You all know how I get down. So please be patient with me. As you always been. <laughs> God's great. God's good. Thank you for everything and all things. Bless your holy name, Lord. We thank you. We bless you. We love you. I pray for better days. And one day all things will change for the better. And allow my ancestors, Lord, the voices be heard tonight. And maybe have a great time. And they want to be empowered. Blessings. Amen. Yes, now this is my soundtrack. I know some of you are probably just listening um, and hearing this song. My man Zor Torretino created for me. So if you need a soundtrack for your shows or your music, movies, uh, definitely give him a holler. I've seen the information. But anyway, we're going to have a great time. This whole month of May is going to be dedicated to Haiti. You understand? Um, to my people, and how can I not have a flag up? Actually, I do have a flag up in my office, but let me let me pull that down for everybody who wants to be on here. Yes. Now this is the Haitian flag. Now, if, if you have never seen this flag then shame upon you. You know, this is, um, a lot of people died, you know, and, and those who think it's just Haitian history, as a matter of fact, it's black history, world history. Haiti made history back in, they say 1804, but really, the war ended in 1803. You know, Toussaint Louverture, we'll get to the WAP to him in 1803, but it was definitely a blessing, it was definitely, um, awesome the fact that he was able to be there for us and I definitely thank him for what he was able to accomplish now you talking about let's go back to the history of who Tucson Lovature is and then so that you could understand the significance of winning that war and eventually getting freedom for all black people that were enslaved um, all the Africans that were enslaved, all the ancestors that were enslaved. Now, one of the things that I want to mention, and the question I want to give everybody, why is it that they never taught us this in school? When I was in school, they only gave us like one sentence, if two sentences regarding Tucson Lubinchur and all the things that he was able to do. Uh, I wasn't taught that. They just taught us, okay, they free themselves from slavery. Bomb, that's it. You know, and I was like, what? You know, my people did that, and this is all they're going to say? That they were able to fight and beat the French to get their freedom? There was so much more than that, you know? But we're going to get into that, because Tucson was able to be the first person, as a matter of fact, uh, definitely the first black person to write his own constitution. Um, that is remarkable, you know, in my opinion. But Mr. Tucson was born actually in 1743, and he died in 1803. Now, he was one of those enslaved um, individuals that had a high position um, on a plantation. Um, he was great with horses. I mean, they even say he was probably half horse. He was so good with horses. I mean, he used to ride horses all day, you know, ride horses all night. And um, it, it was definitely uh, amazing the fact that he was able to fight, you know, to, 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 to get the freedom 
for our people, but to be able to uh, obtain all the knowledge that he was able to um, to get because he was very close with the slave master, um, Brita, and being so close to the slave master, he was able to actually get an education and get an education as a young um, French, you know, Frenchman, where the son of Brita, his master. Being close to the sun, he was able to travel to France and around the world and educate himself. He was able to <laughs> uh, accomplish quite a bit. You know, that, that was definitely a very interesting situation for you to be able to be educated at a time where black folks was not being educated. And that was um, something to his advantage that he obviously uh, took, took advantage of. Now, being that he had that, that high position um, as a as an African, he was able to learn about finances as well. Mr. Toussaint, um, they say he was actually a, a uh, multi-millionaire. He was a millionaire. I mean, he had quite a bit of money, and he obtained his money. Um, by purchasing land, horses all through Haiti, land, you know, throughout the world. Um, you know, he had a wife, he had children. Uh, and, and one of the things that I love about Tucson was that he also uh, loved the garden. Now, one thing that many generals, one of the top, you know, the top generals of the world, or army lieutenants and all that good stuff, many of them love planting for some reason, you know. So the fact that, you know, you have these people fight these wars and then they go ahead and, and have their own garden. You're talking about, like, very powerful men. Nothing feminine in the bottom. But he was very fond of gardening. And I, I believe he did that so that he can find peace um, in the world of um, Tormor. And the fight, the Haitian Revolution um, began can't really they can't really pinpoint when it actually began but I know it started in like 1794 um, actually a little before then because you had a little rebellions that was sparking off throughout the, the land of Haiti uh, which back then was um, called Saint Dominique now what set the stage for the rebellion is something that um, we must understand like why is it that Haiti had the rebellion and how and why were they successful? Now you're talking about Tucson was in charge of 4,000 generals. Not generals, 4,000 generals. Well, you could call them generals. They're all African kings and queens. They're women in these wars as well, in the rebellion. But you're talking about an army of 4,000 men and women, African men and women, compared to 45,000 uh, French men under the leadership of um, Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, how is it that 4,000 men defeats 45,000? You know what I mean? That number is remarkable. Like, how do you win a battle like that? And I can definitely tell you how. This was a very spiritual battle. You know, it was beyond the physical. You have roughly hmm roughly 3.5 4.5 million Africans that were enslaved and brought to the Caribbean now you're talking about not just in Haiti but 800,000 of them went to Haiti so a good portion went to the island um, to the French territory you have Jamaica you got you know Trinidad you know the Portuguese the uh, British the French, the Spanish, they all had their stakes and claims in the different islands. You, you know, as I mentioned, you Haiti, Jamaica, Bahamas, um, the Virgin Islands, um, you know, many various uh, islands. They had, you know, the uh, slaves, Africans there, but also Jamaica had a lot of wars as well. They had a lot of rebellions as well. As a matter of fact, they were almost successful. It. it the only reason why the Jamaicans did not win their, their, that war compared to why the Haitians won the war was because one thing that uh, that bothers me today 
um, that we can't do today. We seem to not be able to do today, but we definitely have the brain power and the, the, the might to do it was the fact that Haitians were united. They had to be united. Toussaint, along with Dessalines, Henry Christophe, and a couple other the generals, um, Toussaint was able to get them all underneath him. Now, why did they allow Toussaint to be the leader? One, he was educated. He spoke a couple languages. And he was also trained in war. You know, he fought, he fought for the Spanish. So he, he learned the art of war. You know, before he even got to the battlefield, he learned how to articulate himself. He learned how to count money. He learned infrastructure. Why not trust a man that has that kind of experience? Why not trust a man that can be a blessing to, you know, the cause? So, obviously, you, put, you place yourself in that kind of situation and everyone's kind of lost a little bit. We're like, what are we going to do? Okay, this is what we're going to do. Tucson was able to get... 4,000 men into the woods to train. So they trained for a couple of months on how to um, load up guns, how to uh, get information, uh, how to strategize, um, different tactics with the, the, the machetes, with the horses. Now mind you, most Haitians came from West Africa. Uh, mainly in the region of uh, Dahomey, which is today Benin. Now, to me, if you do your research or if you're a historian like me, I'm, I'm a big, uh, you know, historical guru. Um, I love history. But when you get an understanding of what actually took place in Haiti and where these Africans came from, you understand that these individuals were warrior queens and kings we've been fighting battles that, that was in our DNA as a matter of fact the homie had one of the most powerful kingdoms in the West Africa you know what I mean in all of Africa actually but one of the most powerful ones it, it went on for like 10 dynasties and Toussaint actually his grandfather was a king in the country so when you have an individual with that kind of experience that kind of DNA you know you in for a battle so I definitely you know it's almost as if his whole life was um, it was predestined you have a man that's educated a man who understood the art of war wealthy intelligent loved to ride horses it's almost as if he was his steps were planted so that he can become the leader, so that he can take over. Now, let me say the, the, the numbers for the show for you guys who's tuned in to call in. That's uh, 305 600 5916. That's 305 600 5916. And um, I love for you guys to definitely call in, um, say your comments, whatever case it be, or questions. Now, back to the war. Now, what caused the war to take place? Of course, slavery. Who wants to be working in the fields? One of the main th reasons why I'm so ambitious today, what motivates me today, and why I'm looking so sharp today, <laughs> which I didn't even mention in the beginning of the show, is because I understood what our ancestors went through back in the day. I understood that they used to work 23 hours in the fields, 23 hours in sugar plane fields. Do you know what sugar sugar cane is? Those sugar cane, and if you haven't eaten a sugar cane, shame on you. But it takes 20 pounds, at least back then, it took 20 pounds of sugar cane to make one pound of powdered sugar. 20 pounds. And to have to work in 110 degree weather in the summertime. Literally, you would have to be in the fields, burning hot, which I don't mind because I love the sun. The melanin is powerful. You know, I, I love it. However, maybe, let, me, let me go ahead and put this flag up here so people can see. You know what I'm saying? What's going on? You know what I mean? You get a clear understanding of what's happening. 
Let me put this to the side a little more. Now, the fact is, to be able to work in those fields, and if you were to get cut by one of the, the blades from the, the sugar cane, you, you're going to be itching. You know what I mean? That's a, it, It's a sharp cut into your skin. So you're going to be bleeding as well. And with all the sugar, now you have these ants. These red sugar ants. Now these ants aren't your ordinary ants. These ants bite you. They inject a little poison in you. So you have these ants eating away at your feet. Eating away at your, your, your hands. And you have to stay out there because if you refuse to work, even though you're being swarmed with ants, it's ant piles all over the place. They didn't have pesticides back then. You have these things eating up at you. You're burning hot. You got the slave uh, overseer whipping you to supposedly motivate you to work on the fields. I mean, imagine doing that all your life. The harsh reality and the, the punishment towards the Africans it was so severe that they had to pass a code called Code Noir. Now, King Henry, whatever number he was, whatever European number he was, the King of France, he had to pass a law because he was told how harsh the Africans were being mistreated um, by the planters. The planters had no holds barred treatment towards um, the, the Africans. You know what I mean? They could do whatever they wanted. They can say, they can talk, they can violate, they can um, uh, molest any, any of the kids. Um, they can chop up any of the hands of the people, of the Africans. They could make them work 20, 30 hours back to back. A woman was to have a baby. As a matter of fact, before she even had the baby, she would work until she was given labor. That's how often, that's how harsh, you know, she was, you know, a woman was being treated at that time. Now, put yourself in those shoes. Put yourself in, 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 in that sort of um, predicament. And would you be able to take that for so long? So eventually, there, you know, so eventually there was going to be um, a rebellion. Eventually, it was just, you know, the, the environment was just pruned for that. It was, you know what I mean? People were, enough was enough, so to speak. You know what I mean? So that's when, you know, the, the fight started. Now, once Tucson was able to get everybody involved into the war, involved into the fight, now you had the women doing their thing. Now, how, how did the women participate and contribute towards this war, this war effort? They were able to do that by poisoning the slave master and, you know, even the children and their wives. Like, so there was a lot of poisoning going on. So you have all the French people terrified in the land. I mean, they were horrified. Now, you have different rebellions sparking off in the north and the south, the east and the west, all through Haiti. But Tucson, being a wise man, he understood, look, if we don't get a hold of this right now, if we don't take control of this and control of the ports, we're going to lose this war and they're going to kill all of us. Because Tucson seen the French army before. So he understood the kind of money and power they had. Now, what was going on in France? Now, France had their own little rebellion going on which was the French Rebellion, where the king was even beheaded. So this actually went towards the Haitian Revolution's benefit, because if they're going through trouble in their own hometown, not to mention the contradiction of freedom when you, you know, you're enslaving people, but you, you're out here screaming freedom, freedom, you know what I mean? That didn't make any sense. But anyway, with their attention on getting the holes of the French uh, Revolution, it gave Tucson and the other um, Africans to organize their energy. Now, if you watched my show last week, you understood I was talking about energy and controlling your energy and your focus and how powerful that was. That's what 
actually happened to Mr. Tucson himself. He was able to get everyone to get focused, take over the borders, set up horse stables all throughout Haiti so we can actually win this war. Now, what was the odds of them winning? It was very slim. And if it wasn't for an African that was sent to Jamaica, so you could call him Jamaican, was a guy named Duty Bookman. He's the one that taught Tucson, um, the, you know, the spirituality, you know what I'm saying? He taught Tucson how to tap into the spiritual energy of his ancestors. Now, in West Africa, everyone in Africa, but because everyone in Africa, black people, we are spiritual beings. Whether you're from the, the Masi tribe in East Africa, whether you was from Kush, which is today Ethiopia in the south, um, the, what you call the South Cataract, that's what they used to, you know, back in the day before Africa was divided into 54, 52 countries. Um, you know, it was mainly only known as North Cataract and South Cataract, you know. And the North, which was, you know, Egypt. And the South, which was, you know, Ethiopia, the, the Kingdom of Kush, where uh, many great monumentals and pyramids were also built. And that's also where uh, Queen Sheba, um, from the Bible, if you guys remember King Queen Sheba with uh, King David, that's where she comes from. And even in Egypt, which was uh, Kemet, known as Kemet. You know, Africa was actually called Arkebulan before the Europeans called it that. So I just had to um, break that down to you guys. My flag fall again. I'm going to keep it on my shoulder because I got to let you guys understand what y'all dealing with. You know what I'm saying? Wear this thing like a trophy because I love my culture. And we all should love our cultures and our heritage. Now, everyone throughout Africa, you know, black people, believe it or not, we did not come to America. We didn't come to the Caribbean. We didn't come to wherever else they shipped us to. We were, um, we had our own religion. We had our own spirituality. We had, you know, our own stuff going. You know what I mean? That's that's who we were. You know what I mean? We had our own stuff. So Christianity was actually brought to us. Now, before then, there was something called um, Vudun, which was, which is our nationality. You know, Vudun is what our ancestors practiced, which was giving reverence to your ancestors. Um, you know, we believe that everything had a spirit. Everything was spiritual, so we were always praying. It wasn't what um, the media portrays as um, worshiping idols, um, putting curses and spells on people. I mean, that's just a misconception that um, people were taught over the years, and and whatever reason they you know they ran with it. But that's not you know that's that's not the case. Um, we, you know, we that made us very powerful because we were in tune with our spirituality, a higher conscious. That's you know that, that's that's pretty much what I you know am um, explaining to you guys, because we are a very powerful people. So Mr. Tucson and Duty Bookman, um, I had to send somebody a message right quick. This is what made us, you know what I mean, different from the world. And believe it or not, in order for us to continue, and I'm glad I mentioned that because I almost forgot. In order for us to continue practicing um, our religion of, of Voodoo, um, we had to use the um, Catholics. Now, 90%, 80% of Haiti is, you know, practice, um, they're Catholics. So... We had to hide um, what we were doing behind, you know, as if we were worshiping, uh, you know, the Pope or, you know, whatever, the St. Mary and all those different saints that, you know, Catholics worship and praise. Correct me if I'm wrong, um, people, regarding the Catholics. But I know that we hid what we were really doing, you know, behind what we wanted them to see us doing. So as you know, as they'll come in to, to watch and see if we were praising the Pope or or, or praying to Saint Mary, 
the slave, the Africans. I hate saying slaves. The Africans, the kings and queens, because that's who we are. They, you know, pretend for a little bit and then went on to the, uh, you know, the the rituals or the worship, um, so to speak. And and that, ladies and gentlemen, was a blessing. That's what made us um, victorious, because we were not just praying or worshiping um, to, um, you know, different spiritualities, whether it's the spirit of the water, spirit of the air, spirit of the birds. Um, there's God in all of that. There's God. God is everywhere. God is a spiritual being. You know, um, God is omnipresent. God is uh, in me. God is in you. You know, that's why we are little gods. You know, God is the main God. Even the Bible says that. Um, we are, you know, we are gods. Tucson knowing who he is, him knowing who his um, grandparents were, his bloodline, you know, how can I be enslaved and enchained when I am royalty? I know who I am. So here he is reading a book one day under a tree, um, as the story goes, and all of a sudden he gets a revelation uh, reading a book that was about a uprising that that happened in Rome, he reads the story and is a there's a man who fought to get his freedom, and even though that rebellion was unsuccessful, guess what? It motivated him. It motivated him to take the leadership. Like this is your right. You are a king. Why are you sitting here as a slave? Whether it was his ancestors speaking to him at the time, which I, I personally believe is what happened, or he just, uh, a light bulb went off in his head. Now, Tucson also had an understanding, and he knew of the harsh realities that was going on in Haiti. He knew that 400 over 435,000 um, Africans um, passed away on their route, you know, from the Atlantic coast, um, from being into uh, St. Dominique. Now, the, the island of St. Dominique is also split with Dominican Republic, which is owned by the Spanish, which I'm going to get into that. And him knowing that, and him knowing who the superpowers was at the time, which was French, the British, the English, you know, still superpowers to this day. You know, say, well, you got Japan, you know, United States, and all that good stuff. But he understood that. And he understood that George Washington and Thomas Jefferson both were very close with, um, with the French. As a matter of fact, Thomas Jefferson and um, George Washington, they gave the French... It's estimated two hundred to four hundred thousand dollars back then to support the war. Why is that? They did so because they knew that if the French, if Toussaint was successful, and they knew he was in charge, the Toussaint made it known. He wrote letters too. Now remember at the beginning of the show, I said he wrote a constitution, which was the first constitution um, written by any black nation, you know what I'm saying? Definitely one of the first that's written in, in the um, Western Hemisphere. This Constitution was even written before the United States Constitution. So you guys got to understand the mindset of this man. He wasn't just some guy out there running around with a machete, chopping heads, shooting guns, riding horses, and sleeping with women all over, you know what I'm saying, out in Haiti, which you know, Haitian women are some of the finest women in the world. Y'all didn't know, I'm just letting you know. The finest, some of the finest queens in the world, you know, they let that be known. Um, <laughs> but all black women are beautiful. As a matter of fact, all women are beautiful. So him understanding that, you know, he understand that, okay, I got to fight. Whatever I'm going to do, I understand that this is a global, social, economic, political situation. He knew that slavery was the bread and butter of the French. So him knowing that how much slavery was um, kept the, the world running. He knew that the French, British, Spanish, 
um, and the Americans all had a hand in it. Whatever he was going to do was going to have to be a huge chess game. He was going to have to defeat each and every one of them. Believe me when I tell you, he had to have been on a very high level mentally and spiritually. This battle was far beyond something that he can physically win, that the Haitians can physically win. It was impossible. All cards stacked against him. All cards, all decks, I mean, all odds, there's no way you're going to win. Some people say the Haitians, the Africans, um, sold their soul to the devil in order to win that war. That's just a bunch of BS. That's not, it's that, you know, it's some kind of folklore. They try to downplay or downgrade the victory of our people. The victory for black people, period. This war was so important. It was one of those things, if we was to lose this, all the spirits of all Africans all over the world would have been crushed. Because best believe me, all the propaganda that these Europeans promoted about slavery and, and how you could come and exploit um, and violate and, uh, you know, just degrade Africa. They would have promoted that, look, we are inferior, we proved it, we defeated the Africans. And there would be no more slave revolts. That's what would have happened. Slave rebellions such as the one that happened with Nat Turner. How do you think Nat Turner did what he did um, here in the, in the colonies? When he, you know, he was able to, 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 to get other Africans, well, you can say um, the uh, African Americans, to revolt against the slave masters here in the colonies. How do you think he did that? He was inspired. Now, Nat Turner was a very interesting individual himself. <laughs> you know, he not only was he like a preacher, he believed that, just like Tucson, he had a calling from God to free his people. That he was the Moses, the black Moses. Let my people go. Very fiery individual. I wish I could get some of his writings, if any of his writings um, exist today. I'm sure some kind of museum may have, but I would love to read um, what was his mindset. I'm very interested in people's mindset and energy because once he read about the slave rebellion in Haiti and the success of it, of Tucson, he was like, why can't we do the same thing? And that's another reason why the Europeans, and even here in America, that is why they don't want us learning about black history and African history year-round. It's because they want us to keep our energy, our frequency very low. To keep our conscious minds low. To be more fleshy. To, you know, to let the, the lower man, which is the body, the flesh, to take control. For we are battling something that is way bigger than flesh and blood. Like I said, it's a spiritual thing. So if you're able to suppress, if you're able to keep under wraps, a person's history you're in a sense controlling their future because your history determines your present your history where your mother and father was born and raised how much money they have you know to pay bills do you have money to pay bills or are you living in the streets due to the lack of money you know what I mean um, how you carry yourself the, your ability to read ladies and gentlemen comes from your history so your history is very much alive today so why is it that these schools aren't you know teaching black history or even this Haitian Revolution on a regular basis why isn't it a big part of the syllabus in the history course because this system is set up that way to keep us um, under wraps to keep us not tapped into our uh, understanding how important and how significant our com contributions was to world history. World history, this African history that I'm sharing with you guys, this Haitian history I'm sharing with you guys, that's what motivated me to do what I'm doing today. That's what pushed me uh, while I was in college, doing this research. That's what pushed me. So I just wanted to, you know, share with you guys that, you know, little bit of information because it's vitally important to understand your history and where you come from. I don't care where you come from, which is from Europe, Japan, well, Asia, of course, um, Australia, um, the Caribbean islands, the way we're here from the United States of America. We all have ancestors somewhere, so it's very important to understand 
the, the the greatness of your people and also the negative or evil things of your people so understand where or why you talk or act a certain way so you could you know reverse that curse so to speak Toussaint he understood that now with the help of um, Jean Jacques Dessalines you know which was um, I posted on my Instagram um, but also you have Henry Christophe now Dessalines was his right hand man Dessalines is, is was someone that didn't have the all the perch that Tucson had um, at as a slave. Um, Jean Jacques Dessalines actually he had he was raised um, very harsh conditions and had a very bitter taste towards um, <laughs> extremely bitter taste towards um, Europeans towards the French. So what did he do? Given the opportunity, Mister. Dessalines went and tried to annihilate and kill every single Frenchman and woman in the land. When Toussaint get, heard about that, that this guy was doing that after they already did on whooped up the French, he had a he had to check him. Like, look, we not getting down like that. This isn't about revenge. We got our revenge. We win in this war. Let's not do something that's gonna come back to haunt us, which was. Um, killing innocent people now are you innocent when you're you're uh, benefiting from the blood sweat and tears and lives of um, of Africans are you truly innocent that you are extremely rich from it you're sleeping well while other people are going through some extremely harsh times so you have to really think about that you know and think about it in that context and while it wasn't just their spiritual um, power that they were able to win the war, but also there's a yellow fever going on in the islands. So that wiped out a lot of the Frenchmen due to natural causes. They just couldn't fight. They weren't used to walking around in swamps. They wasn't used to walking around, uh, you know, in, 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 in that terrain. It was so hot. You understand? So this is what kept Tucson, Louverture, and the Haitian Revolution going, kept it going alive and helping us win. Because we simply did not and would not give up. We, we were brought up in those harsh conditions. They couldn't keep up, so therefore they lost. But what makes Mr. Tucson so brilliant? He was able to play the French, the Spanish, and the Americans against each other. That was a decisive move from a master strategist. This was a slap to the United States of America. This was a slap in the face of George Washington. Someone who promotes freedom, land of the brave, um, freedom for everyone, justice for all. Promoting this while having slaves themselves. Promoting this while violating black women and even young women um, teenage girls so I believe that there's somewhere in the Constitution or somewhere in the handbooks of the United States of America to be sure to remind Haiti that we hate them and we despise them for ending slavery because they knew, like all the other superpowers already knew it, this was very wrong. Not just morally or ethically, but definitely economically. You can, like, how can you justify enslaving anyone? By him being able to do that, it made him the greatest general in world history. Because guess who they consider the greatest general in world history? Napoleon Bonaparte. And who did Toussaint defeat? He defeated Napoleon Bonaparte. So if you beat the best, what does that make you? Like real talk. If if you know what I'm saying? If Mayweather gets beat, gets whooped up in a boxing match, and he was considered the best. Who's who's gonna be the best? And by the way, I wanna see him fight Pacquiao. Just let that be known, you know what I'm saying? But I know there's a lot of politics that go behind that. So I really don't understand how they don't acknowledge Toussaint Louverture the way he should be acknowledged. They should have a, a statue in Washington of this man. 
They should have a statue, especially here in Florida, because in Georgia, where they do have a nice statue for those who fought in 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 Georgia um, after the war, Haitian soldiers. One second. Yes, it's King Kevin's show, caller two six eight. Um, what's your name? Where you calling from? Well, I appreciate the call, my brother. And um, you had a question or comment about the Haitian Revolution or the greatest general of all time, Toussaint Levinshire? That's a very good question. And and, and what, what was your next question? Or, or that's the main what you wanted to know? Oh, definitely. Well, he, he was uh, taught, I guess you could say he had multiple classrooms. One, he was the good friend of his slave master, um, breeder of his son. They were about the same age, so whenever um, his son would go off to college or travel or vacation, um, Tucson played as, I guess you can say, his assistant. Actually, he was his assistant. He was supposed to be the slave to him. So as he's in class, learning and reading all these different things in France, um, the son, I don't know his name is, but I know his last name is Brita. Tucson was also learning and reading at the same time. So that gave him a huge advantage towards uh, just knowing about worldly affairs, you know, being, uh, you know, well-educated and well-versed. And then you're talking about, you know, how you get educated um, in, in St. Dominique, uh, which is today Haiti. He was able to learn through... Uh, duty bookman obviously I just mentioned about learning about the spiritual powers and tapping to um, his ancestry but also um, on the slave fields experience you know what I'm saying being someone who's able to, to freely walk around the plantation and to, to oversee the other slaves he was he was sort somewhat was what you call a hookup man whatever anybody needed on the plantation they hardly had two you know what I'm saying and, I, and, and that gave him reps uh, a good reputation and no wonder he became the general of uh, the leader of one of the greatest wars of all time especially in black history this was a very important war I can't even stress that enough all right well I, well, I appreciate my brother man checking in I take it take it you're Haitian or you just wanted to uh, uh, learn about my man Tucson Okay. Okay. Oh, no doubt. That was a definitely a great question, my brother. And um, I appreciate the call and you checking in. And that was, you know, that was a well thought out question. So um, we definitely, you know, reconvene this. And don't forget, the whole month going to be on Haiti. Um, and, you know, I appreciate you calling in and, and you take it easy, my brother. All right. Blessings. And yeah, he mentioned the, the, uh, the general that actually had uh, one of the last generals that was in, in, in Haiti, the French general, General Lerlique. Le Le I actually did a presentation um, on, not General Lerlique, 
but his role in the whole thing in capturing Tucson, which you're going to get into. But let me go into my black history celebrity uh, for the day. The King Kevin Show, Black History Month every month. Is Mr. Willie Gary. Now, those of you who don't know who Mr. Willie Gary is, uh, I'm going to make it short and brief, but if you read my book, then you understand you know, who Mr. Willie Gary is. Um, my book, The Courage Should Believe. And I actually, the reason why I'm dressed like this today is because I was at his office. Now, Mr. Willie Gary is a, um, an attorney located in Store, Florida. Um, you know, multi millionaire. I believe he's a billionaire. But definitely a multi-millionaire. I mean, this guy is, has 10 Bentleys, um, private jet. His wife been with him since they were in college. And these two individuals, definitely about 60 years old. So, um, but he was born and raised. And he's not Haitian. He's, a, he's American. Um, however, he's still a brother, you know. <laughs> he was able to sue Walt Disney successfully. Uh, Microsoft successfully, um, Anheuser Busch, the the beer company successfully. I mean, you talking about lawsuits for ten million, twenty million, a hundred million, two hundred million. I think his highest lawsuit he won was two hundred twenty-five million dollars. So he's something very serious. And I'm going to share this with you guys. I actually met Mr. Willie Gary. But before I met him, I seen a. CBS, no, 60 minute news special about him. And then after that news special, um, you know, I became very motivated. I see this guy and they say he's in Florida. He's in Florida. Why haven't I ever heard of him? And he's right here in store of Florida, one hour north of Fort Lauderdale from where I am. And two weeks, not two weeks, but when I end up doing some time in jail, those who don't know my story, you know, I used to be, you know, one of those, uh, uh, thugs, I guess you can say. One of those confused, you know, black men that just had a bunch of energy, misguided, and get ran to some trouble, trying to make some money. Yada, yada. He ended up in, in the Black Enterprise magazine that I read about while I was incarcerated. So I'm doing my about nine months in jail. I get, I read the article, and I'm like, wow, I got to meet this man. And Therefore, I wrote a plan for my life. He wasn't in that plan, but I did say to myself, man, I'm going to meet this guy. Two years later, about a year, year, two years later, I, once I get out, I'm invited. I started my business and do a networking event. I met a woman who liked what I was doing, so she invited me to Willie's Gary's Christmas party that they have every year in Stewart. And this was back in 2006, the last year they actually had the Christmas party, was, which was my first time going there. But they've been doing it for many years previous. They ran out the whole beach in Stewart. Like his law firm, the, you know, people in his law firm. And then you have the whole block, Bismarck, he Bill Clinton, the Temptations were there. Um, thousands of um, people there, free food free drinks and I'm not talking about like crappy food cheap food top of the line three course meals any kind of drink and champagne you wanted I don't think they were serving Chris style but I mean I'm talking about from from soft drinks to milk to alcohol wine I mean it was upscale I was dressed sharp me and my cousin Gary we got a rental car we went up there in suits and business cars on deck I mean we had a great time but anyway I went to the party, you know, I was, I was extremely happy, you know, that we went, met some great people, some people I'm still in contact with, one or two of them, actually, and uh, about mm, a month later, I go to a boxing match that Don King was hosting in Hollywood, the Hard Rock, a heavyweight boxing fight, right, so I walk in there, I'm chilling, and I just happened to, you know, to look to my right. Look at, you know, there's all kind of celebrities in there. You got Bruce Willis came in there. His own, they, they had Bruce Willis come through his own entrance. Him and his entourage. That's how major Bruce Willis was. I never knew he was that big, that big time. I knew he was a big time uh, celebrity, but I didn't think he was so big that they felt as if they had to escort him privately into the um, arena. So that was an experience. But I look to the right. I see, you know, a couple of, you know. 
um, black men, all three dressed in suits. So they stuck out here. Everybody dressed casual. They hanging out. And I looked and I noticed one of them was really Gary. I was like, oh, that's what's up. So Bonnie just jumped, you know, directly to him. I went and uh, sat down. And then once I got my seat, you know, got my ticket, got my seat. And I was like, man, I, I need to say something to this dude. So nobody seemed to know who this guy is except me. And uh, so I walk in, the, you know, I, I walk in front of him. And I looked to him. I said, hey, how you doing, Mr. Gary? Um, you know, I, I, I put my hand out. Man, I'm Kevin Dover. He got up, shook my hand, and he asked me a couple of questions. And I asked him a couple of questions. And it was like, man, you know, he was like, man, I'm glad, you know, you out here and you're a business owner, you're doing your thing. Um, I gave him my card, but I didn't take a picture with him. Back then, this was back in 2007. So Instagram and all of that, social media, wasn't as big as it is today. It wasn't as prevalent. But I did have a phone I could take pictures. So, so ever since I, I, I left that, that night, that fight, um, I was so, like, mad at myself. Like, you know, cause especially when I told the lady who invited me to, the, to his Christmas party, why didn't, she asked me, why didn't you take a picture of him? And I was like, well, I seen him t uh, two weeks prior. I seen him again. I read about him. I know I'm going to see him again in the future. And guess what happened? You know what I mean? Years later, uh, uh, eight years later to be exact, look at me now. I was at his office today filming the documentary, um, The Courage to Believe. So you get a preview of that documentary, um, you know, a couple, mm, about a month from now, because I'm having a black on black crime prevention panel here in Fort Lauderdale. And as a matter of fact, we're doing an ongoing fundraiser that I love for for you all to support. You support me on here, King Kevin Show. You support me on social media. You support me in my events there when I'm having it. Um, the fundraiser going on. I send out invites with donation um, link to my PayPal. And this is, for those of you who don't know, this is to empower our young men and women, especially our young black men and women, our young kings and queens, to make successful decisions rather than tragic ones. Mr. Willie Gary and several other um, individuals and even some street interviews, they all give a positive message on how to become successful um, or how they ended up where they are. Now, not everyone in this documentary is rich. They're going to share their testimonies, real life testimonies of how they overcame adversity and how they became who they are and what they are today. So definitely big up to um, Willie Gary. I mean, he definitely made my day. Um, as I mentioned, um, he is huge. Um, he's won awards of up to, I said 225 million. I'm sorry. I meant to say 500 million. You know what I mean? That's how big of an attorney um, he is. You know, he does the corporate lawsuits and things like that. So definitely shout out to Willie Gary and the whole camp. And thank you, Corey for making this happen. This would not have happened if I didn't get in contact with Corey who um, happens to know somebody who knows somebody and then that person that knew somebody knew me and knew what I what I was doing. So this interview it took literally eight years to happen but for the past six months you know I was calling, emailing uh, Corey who's his secretary and she looked out for me and made it happen. She understood, she believed in the vision. She loved what I was doing. She loved my attitude. She loved the whole thing, the cause. And she was like, why not? When I find a space to get you in here, we're gonna make it happen. So he was he just in it finished a big trial. So I couldn't get in to see him to his office until today. As a matter of fact, they were willing to come down here. But I was like, no, I don't want to come up there. You know what I mean? So I you know, me and Ephraim, shout out to Ephraim. I love you, man. Good looking out. Ephraim made this happen as well because Ephraim, if it wasn't for his diligence and his ambition to film with me, along with me, none of this would be possible right now, filming the documentary. So please go to my website, my new website, which is Kevin Dorival, um, K-E-V-I-N-D-O-R-I-V-A-L.com. 
and click on the support link. You can donate anything from a dollar to a thousand dollars, ten thousand, hundred thousand, hundred million. Look, I'm not gonna block your blessing. Continue blessing me, and thank you for those who you had donated already. Besides that. I'm so excited about um, the Black on Black Crime Prevention Panel we're getting ready to have. And also, I'm getting ready to go to Jacksonville. So, I'm doing a lot. And it would not be possible without your support. And I give all glory to God, of course. Everything that will happen, has happened, and you will be victorious. Now, get back to the show. Now, what happened with Tucson? Mr. Tucson ended up getting kidnapped. He got kidnapped, uh, which in a foolish fashion, to be honest with you. And it, it hurts me to think about it because I know the potential he could, you know, that, that Haiti had back then. He had already started infrastructure, building roads, um, communication, the ports, um, a tax system. He actually brought back slavery in a way. You know, which is probably only the downside of his um, glory, so to speak. Because he understood that we need to make money. I can't support the army and to protect Haiti if I can't pay the army. So he brought back slavery. And at a tax, you know, the people to go ahead, they had to be forced into labor. Because the, uh, the Africans, they didn't want to go back to the work. They didn't want to go back to the, you know, the fields. They just want to crop, you know, grow and crop their own land and just enjoy life. You know, kick back, chill, have fun, drink, worship, and um, have babies. But Tucson was like, no, this cannot be so. So there was actually a lot of um, rivals amongst the different factions, different sections of Haiti from the south, the east, the north, and the west. So just as hard Tucson had to fight to beat the French, he had to do the same thing to fight other Africans who wanted to be the leader. This is where pride came in. The pride, as a matter of fact, is what I truly believe is what destroyed Haiti because what Tucson did, not only did he write the, the Constitution, but he also made himself sole ruler of the whole country. Everything had to be run by him. In many ways that's a bad thing because one, you put too much pressure on yourself and number two, now if you die, what happens afterwards? So he didn't really even have a successor. Dessalines became the successor. Dessalines um, ended up taking over after he left. And he didn't just leave. General um, Lalique came to Haiti you know, and wanted to create a truce. Tucson being, okay, this is my land. I just whoop y'all. Y'all in my country. Why I'm finna hide from y'all? Of course I'll meet up with you. So they had this big elaborate tent where Tucson had dinner with General Lalique to discuss a truce between um, France and, and Haiti. Now what ended up happening is Tucson went to this meeting by himself, which was his first mistake and eventually his last mistake. Isn't that something? Your first mistake was your last mistake because that actually ended his life. They kidnapped him, tied him up, and sent him to France where he would be starved to death, literally. And it's cold up there in, in those mountains that they had him in this dungeon. So he wrote letter after letter to um, Napoleon Bonaparte who despised Tucson because he knew from here on out, he'll be known in all of history, in world history, to have been defeated by someone that was supposed to be inferior, by someone that was supposed to be unintelligent, someone who was supposed to be an animal by an African, Tucson. So that's why he never replied to any of the letters. He just wanted him to start a death. He was literally... Tucson was known as a uh, as a, um, a, a nail in his, in his feet, something like that. They would say a thorn in his thigh is what they called it. Dessalines, which which I mentioned earlier, was a very bloodthirsty, revenge-seeking individual. He ended up wiping out every French man and woman in the island. If they didn't leave, they was dead. 
and he labeled himself Emperor for Life, which was unfortunate because now you have someone who, you know, who wants complete autonomy and wants to rule everything. He, did, he wasn't even educated, so he didn't, he didn't know what he was doing other than being a ruler and a great general. Now, don't take that from him. He was a great general. This Ali was a fabulous general, a fabulous right-hand man, and he took orders as a good soldier from Tucson. Now, we look at Haiti today, and which we're going to get into the next show. The next next week will be about the future of Haiti, and I'm going to dive back into the past, um, but we're really going to be focused on the next show. But what happened was, what what Tucson created was a country with no leadership. There was no provision for that. So you have a lot of leaders, a lot of um, Africans who are very powerful of their heritage and their culture. And it even runs down today, even in myself and many of my peers, like we are proud to be Haitian, but unfortunately what happens is that we are so proud that we don't take into consideration that your pride is the first sign of destruction. We're so caught up in this victory of being, you know, the first independent black nation in the world. What about the rest of history? You know what I'm saying? What about the future? I mean, we can't be caught up so much into the past. I don't care what it was. You, you know, if you're so caught up in you graduating college, well, what you going to do, you know, with the future? Get, you know, get that victory, embrace it, enjoy it, like we should do as a people. But let's plant seeds for a better tomorrow. Let's put our energy more focused on that and not just on being the first independent nation, black independent nation um, in the Western Hemisphere, which is Haiti. You know, we got officially our independence in 1804, but in actuality, we had our independence since 1794. Now, why did the world finally want to recognize us in 1804? It's because they had no choice. Because we did that. You know what I mean? But I'm happy about that. But I don't want that to be my soul being and purpose of being alive and being free. So we got to, as kings and queens, come up with a way somehow, somehow, you know, get off that high horse of being, you know, the greatest man alive, the greatest king alive, or the greatest queen alive, I'm Haitian, we this or that. Man, forget all that. That was yesterday. Yes, we are going to enjoy and celebrate, but let's put our energy on being something productive, of being an independent black nation. Let's kick out all the European powers that's in Haiti right now, that's exploiting our land, exploiting it every day. Even in, what, 2011, 2012, when they found all that, you know, $30 billion worth of minerals and gold in the land. And all of that goes to these foreign powers that came here to drill in our land, and we got to give them all of that. Like, like, are you serious? That could not have been me, President of Haiti. But we're going to save that for another day. Because I'm going to ruin what I'm going to talk about. Remember, this whole week, the King Kevin show is going to be about Haiti. It's going to be about the past, present, and future of Haiti. We're going to talk about earthquake at some point. I'm going to have some people who are in Haiti call in. Um, God willing, they can get through. But it's all good. Because you are more than the conqueror. We are more than conqueror. Yeah, they want to project us as being a poor nation poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere, but it was not always like that. And let me say this, Haiti was at one point the richest, one of the richest countries in the world. Would you believe that? Yes, Haiti. We were economically strong, but it was the wrong foundation. It was based on slavery and all the sugar cane. We produced three quarters of the world's sugar. You know what kind of part it is? That's like saying one, and that was like a, a drug back then, believe it or not. People were hooked on sugar. That's like a Colombian drug lord. Or whoever, whatever drug lord, whatever country. Owning three quarters of all the drugs of the world. You know how powerful that person would be or their organization. 
So, but anyway, that's pretty much what we had to say tonight on the King Kevin Show. I want to make sure that I leave you guys out, you know what I mean, with that tidbit right there. And, of course, we're going to keep moving. We're going to keep doing our thing. Um, it's been a marvelous night, the King Kevin Show. I finally get a chance to get out of these clothes and stay tuned for the documentary. I will not stop. Know what I be tonight. Peace, blessings, and may God bless you. It's the King Kevin Show.